Hello, everyone, and welcome to Writers Drinking Coffee. This is a podcast based on writers sitting around drinking coffee or wine and talking about writing, publishing, and the whole creative process. We do not censor ourselves, so consider us PG-13. Your hosts today are John Schmidt and me, Jeannie Warner. This is episode 117, interview with Lisa Tsarina Michaud. Welcome, Lisa. Hey, Jeannie. Hi, John. Nice to be here. Oh, we are so glad to have you. And thank you. Lisa sent me a copy of her brand new book. Is this your first book out, Slanted and Disenchanted? Yes, it's my first. Well, I loved it. It is a YA novel, and it's about bands and touring and eating disorders and bisexuality and bad parenting and 9-11 and obscure prog rock and a whole discovery of America wrapped into a hint of romance. And that's a lot. It's perfect. That Yeah, you pretty much touched on all of the uh, the emotional points. <laughs> like, wow. Oh, was, I, I really enjoyed reading this, and I and I gonna encourage everyone to. the The only challenge that I had in this one is this is the YA book that was kind of for me that I feel like I missed by being twelve years too. I mean, I counted them twelve years too old, so it spoke to me. Um, tell me about YA in general. You you chose to make this a YA book. How how did you? decide on YA versus general literature or anything else? What was your what was your goal? Well, I had been working on this, uh, on a memoir of my life, uh, moving to France. I do live in France. And I was writing this memoir for years. And it was really bad. I just, it wasn't, maybe I'm too young to write a memoir. Maybe I have to wait another 20 years. And so I just- No, sorry. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know. No, you're not. <laughs> wait, wait, wait another year. I don't know. But I just kind of put writing aside for a few months. Um, I'm also a translator, so work up busy. And then I had these two characters just come into my head and they were talking to each other. It was really like something quite mystical. I never considered re- uh, writing YA. I enjoy reading it, but I just didn't, I never thought that I could actually write it. And so I just sat down and wrote this story and I pounded out the first manuscript in the first draft in three months because I couldn't the characters were talking so much. They were noisy. And I was getting up at 4 a.m. writing this story. And I didn't even know it was what genre it really was. I was just writing it. And after when I finished the manuscript, I printed it out and I read it. I wrote, I said to myself, I just wrote a YA novel. Like it really came out of nowhere. So I really wish I had, you know, have this like passionate story of how I've been always wanting to be this YA a novelist, but it just it really came from nowhere, coming from writing memoir for almost 10 years. But this is a passionate story about how writing your memoir led to a written book full of wonderful things. So you do have this great story. But I want to hear, because I'm a geek, about the prog rock influences and how how you made music integral to it. And, you know, what kind of music is in the book? How far do you range? Do, do, do you talk about music literature at all? Tell me about the music. Oh, she does. You're going to love this. <laughs> So my father was a roadie for this band called Emerson, Lake and Palmer. And <laughs> so, oh my God. Don't yeah. He, he, he's a roadie for ELP. Um, and he also, um, my grandmother's jazz singer um, were from my uh, paternal side. We're Mexican. So she's Mexican, Mexican native. And she decided to put out a family album with like my dad and on this album, which I have on vinyl. There's a young Chick Corea playing on it. And every so often I hear my grandmother on French radio in um, French jazz radio. So she moved to Paris. So music has always been a part of my life, whether it's been jazz, my dad being a roadie for ELP. I mean, he had stopped being a roadie when I was born, but it's just, you know, these conversations come up. Like we talked about everything from like Metallica to Miles Davis and music was a huge part of my the paternal side of my family. So it's just that just was me pouring out like the love I have for music. And it could be anything from, yeah, prog rock. My dad loved Genesis, early Genesis with Peter Gabriel. Early Genesis was great. <laughs> right. All that is like just so like, you know, enchanting and so, you know, theatrical. Um, and then and then Gabriel left and then we got I Can't Dance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, sorry, that's like a nerdy joke. Yeah, uh, and he couldn't. 
Um, yeah, and he couldn't. Um, and but then there's this other side of me that also really likes like punk rock and um, girl uh, feminist girl bands from the '90s. So I was able to just kind of able to appreciate both the sides. Like I can listen to the Grateful Dead, and then I can listen to p- a girl punk from the '90s, and make sense of both of it and understand the experience the musicians are having without having to choose sides. Cause a lot of people were like, well, how can you like enjoy such like conflicting tastes? It's like, because it's music and it's someone's, you know, life work coming out of their fingers and coming out of their mouths. Um, Music lovers. And and I clearly appreciated that the characters in your book, and therefore I presume you were excited about the musicianship as much as you know the music and i think music is wonderful because it can speak to so many people in so many different ways but i i love that you were talking about yes you did have to mention the miles dane miles uh, davis herbie hancock um some of the others but i can see that you're very conflicted on the subject of fish <laughs> How do you actually- re- I, I think we need to talk about your fish problem I am a huge fish fan. I love them. We're going to go see them (laughs) next week in Atlantic City. But when I had a guy break up with me because I told him I liked fish and it's just Ah. mean thing. People hate fish for no reason. Well, he didn't deserve you if he hated fish. He's not worthy. No, he was terrible. And, you know, and I thought I was being like open minded. You know, he was into all the indie rock and I'm like, cool, me too. And then I was like, you know, and I really like fish. Like I saw them play at, you know, in Inglewood uh, last month. And he was like, are you kidding me? He's like, that's frat boy music. And he never spoke to me again. (laughs) Wow. Did did you tell him that, wow, boy, can the boys from Rush really play their instruments? Because I mean, (laughs) No, I, yeah, I don't know. I just, anyway, no, I didn't say that. I was just stunned. I was 20, but, you know, and there's just wow. this, like stigma with been... fish. People hate fish for no reason. And then you play them fish and they're like, oh, this is really good. And it's like, they're musicians. They're like trained musicians inspired by jazz and bluegrass. Like how, how could you like, how could that be so like controversial? I, I don't know. I think it's there's two different levels of music. People that there's folks that like the lyrics, folks that like certain common familiar sounds of genre. Like if you like pop, you sometimes there are people that only like pop in particular. And so if you get them really detailed into, you know, if you threw them at Rush 2112, a rock album, they'd be, what what is this? So I don't know. I don't know. But yeah, totally. But I love how that it, I mean, between prog rock and indie rock, and I was going to ask <laughs> as a strange sort of question, did you ever read the questionable content online cartoon? The questionable content? No, no, oh. I haven't. Well, I'm going to hook you up with something fun and a link in there because questionable content as near as I can tell for the first year was all on the topic of indie rock and and prog rock and the guys that are like oh well the minute everybody's heard of this band it's not cool anymore and i have to let it go and i just think you'll find it hilarious <laughs> oh my goodness yes yes i love i love that rock snobbery is like so much fun you know totally like, like record store rock the, snobs <laughs> the, the cartoonist has gone so far as to release albums because he's actually an instrumentalist where he lives so <laughs> amazing yes please i would love to check that out i love all that stuff Well, I I have a question that's been sort of burning in all of this because I've gone out and I've listened to uh, the recording of you making rock music and having fun with your kid, et cetera. How much how much of Carla is you, the main character? Um, Yeah. Okay. so, yes, I definitely pulled from my own experience. Um, I did. I started the band actually for research. Those guys were my my neighbors and I kind of like weaseled my way into their band uh, under the guise of research and I well did done. research. <laughs> yes. In terms of like just playing the guitar um, and learning about calluses and all of those things. But um, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say it's she's me at all because she's, I'm pretty outspoken. I pretty much tell things like it is. I actually identify more with Pete and how he responds to things and how um, outspoken he is. However, Carla's background, yes, of course, comes from my uh, the maternal side of my family, which is Italian. Right. So I kind of wanted to play a little with, with that. And yes, alcoholism does run in my family, and it's a very serious topic for me. Um, I've been in Al-Anon since 2007. Oh, you. Um, 
Yeah, thank you. I, I go in France and that's like not as fun because I have to share in French and uh, I don't enjoy being emotional in French. You know, you always want to do it in your mother tongue, but it helps. And I, I really like the, the women in the in the group. And so, yes, I do very much relate to her background, but in terms of her personality, no, I'm, I'm definitely more Pete's personality. I, you lead us all to fall just a little bit in love with Pete. And <laughs> I, I love that Pete had such an interesting background too. And I don't want to spoil everything for, for people because you really should go read the book. It's fun. Was, was there pieces of Pete in the husband or we all say that all of the, all of our characters are facets of us, but who did you pull from for the rest of your Pete? Pete is interesting. He is a few people. Um, I was inspired a little bit by the drummer of the Black Keys, Patrick nice. Carney, who's like just a trash talking, like just kind of like talk about cursing. Like I, I watched him in a podcast a few years ago and it was just the most entertaining thing because he was just ragging on his record company, calling them like douchebags and jerks. And I'm like, I think they're still with this record company. And he just like, doesn't give a fuck. Like, and it was, so I kind of pulled from him, um, me, and then a little bit of my husband, how my husband is like, so respectful of his parents. And he's like such a good son. So I pulled from a few people when, uh, when constructing Pete and I totally know, you know who he looks like in my head. He was Timothy Chalamet from uh, Call Me By Your Name. That's ah. what I had visually in my head, just with a pair of glasses, though. Well, that's fair because Timothy's gorgeous. So. so I have a sideways question on this one pertaining to writing. You're writing about musicians, obviously, and you write a, wrote a YA novel. How did you handle the swearing in the novel? Did you have to, to, did you have to edit it out? Did you have to change it? What would you do? Well, I kept a lot of the swearing, but I, you know, a lot of my favorite YA novels from uh, like Mary H.K. Choi and then like Blake Nelson, there's some, there's some strong language in there and even more graphics, uh, sexual content and scenes that I felt that I could probably get away with it. But, you know, on the Amazon page, there is a note that there is strong language and sexual references that, you know, so parents who uh, want to check out the book beforehand, they're aware but other than that, I pretty much kept a lot of it in. And okay. yeah, I, I was going to say, I actually liked that you made them. It is a YA novel, but they are of a certain age. They are neither of them in high school any longer. They are, nor, nor are they in college necessarily because they both haven't gone but could. But it actually put it at an age appropriate for that kind of thing, which I think is also encouraging. You know, it's still YA. It's still something that a young music lover can agree with without necessarily threatening their parents with, oh my gosh, she is not advocating that 16-year-olds six, run out and start doing it. Okay, thank you. I'm glad. Yeah, I, I picked that age too. To, it felt like a safe age where it's still like naive and still innocent, but still old enough where, yeah, your, your parents know you're probably having sex and you're cursing and I'm sure you've tasted alcohol where it's not shocking you know 20 feels like a safe age where it's in between your your teenager but you're not it's like that weird transition into you know adulthood i i liked it because it seems that I've, I've read so many books where they have authors that why is the girl always 17 is it because uh, she's sexy sexy and 17 in paradise by the dashboard light <laughs> chaz was saying which that 17 is just this amazing number and all the guys like to use it but you made her a real age so thank you for that I was going to also say, I love that you included a, ver a playlist for it, saying that the, the playlist of the things that they're talking about for people that want to explore that kind of music. And I've, I've started seeing more of that from authors like Carrie Vaughn did it. Um, Richard Cadry's actually in a band and says, I wrote this music and it goes with my Sandman Slim novels. And it's awesome. Well, yeah, I wanted, I wanted the readers to like, maybe you know to get involved in the story and maybe they don't know all of those bands and that's possible and you know I, I took I really took my time selecting the tracks and you know on the playlist it's there's a theme that a lot of the songs talk about American cities that they're driving through or driving around um, and using the bands that they talk about at the same time and I just imagined Carl and Pete in their beat-up van listening to this this cassette or burn CD that they decided on because they butt heads a lot on their uh, their influences. So this they, was their, comp their compromise mixtape. 
I, I love that they had a compromised of these things we can both agree on for, for all of us that have ever ridden a car with somebody. I'm like, okay, what do I know that the other person won't hate that I can still put in? Yeah, it can get really tense. It's like, if you know, if you're, you don't agree on the music, music is important. Otherwise, what are you listening to? I mean, now there's podcasts, which is great. But before oh, yeah. then, you know, it was like, what CDs do you bring? Because you, you don't, you can't bring every piece of music. You know, you only, your CD book is binder is only so big. Oh, God. This was a time when you could have actually ripped a CD with different things on it. And that was, that was what an interesting thing of setting in different points in time, because now kids wouldn't even think about, you know, putting a DVD collection together. But that's something that perfectly fits in this year, because in your book, you talk about 9-11. And I, this is the first book I've read where 9-11 happens to the characters in the book, and especially New Yorkers. It's very profound. So that was extremely cool. Yeah, um, that's, that came from a personal, of course, that came from personal experience. You know, I had just turned 20 and I was like, the world is in front of me. And I started, I was touring with some rock band and then 9-11 happened and it was like, wow, this could happen. I just remember just like, I mean, it was, it just felt like, I just felt like I didn't know anything anymore. And I just like how the characters felt so lost, like everything seemed so great. And then that happened and you, you just, it's just, I don't know where to go from here. And that's that I wanted to really convey that kind of like halt in emotions and just how, you know, how you just, just couldn't predict something like that and how we were, because it was such a new experience, no one had ever seen anything like that. I think we were all bumping into each other emotionally because we just didn't know how to process this. You know, we didn't have like a tactile memory to what had happened. And I just remember it was just very, a very weird, stagnant time for so many people. And I hope I was able to convey that tastefully. And yeah. um, I, I think it was very tastefully done. And I, I liked that it had the, you know, do you know people and that people knew people and that relatives were calling each other. And this was probably one of the major events in the same way that Pearl Harbor Day was for the boomers. This very much was for the latest generation. It was impactful. And, and like I said, I thought this was neat. You're the first um, author that has used that as a, this shakes everything up. And to a certain extent, this almost made it okay for them to go on tour because it's like, well, what else do you do? Well, we can sit around watching them rebuild, build it and breathing the smoker. Let's, let's get away and try to do a tour. So that was cool. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. And I did exactly that. I went to California and, and, and never really, and yeah, and stayed there for five years after, after 9-11, I was just like, okay, let's just, let's leave New York. And I'm born and raised New Yorker. I grew up in Manhattan and then moved out to Long Island. So I have both, both worlds of the city life and the suburban life. And it just, yeah, it felt, it felt comfortable having them leave New York at that moment. And, and you do describe touring beautifully. <laughs> although, although I'm sort of interested that they, it, it, there's, there's part of me that says, wow, touring, getting gigs. They did it without agents. That's a lot of work. <laughs> I, I reached out to a lot of my, um, my friends who were in bands back in the day. And I was like, how did you guys get shows? How did that work? And I mean, these were really gr grimy, divey bars and, uh, one of them told me that she would find out who was like a more popular band in the area and then would kind of contact them and see if they can just get on the bottom of the bill. So I kind of used that as a way for them to get all these shows and a tour after three months of playing. I guess that's where the fiction comes in. Oh, no, it's a beautiful fantasy. And everybody who's ever been in a band will say, yeah, that could totally happen to me. So it was beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I really, another thing that I, I wasn't sure of at first is you jump back and forth between perspectives quickly. And at first I wasn't sure about it, but by the end it, it created a movie feeling for me. So in a lot of ways, this was very screenplay almost of reading her perspective, him perspective. And by the end of it, it worked. And I was going to say, I, I, I doubted you at first and I apologize because you did pull it through and it did work by the end. I, I thought it was interesting that you did. did. Did you see this as a visual in your head or was it more words in you? Are you a more visual writer or you just kind of see the words appearing? 
It was definitely, it's visual, all visual. And I, the characters, I see that. Yeah. I, I, I play them out as I play the story out in my head visually. And then, and then I write it and I hope what I see in my head comes through my fingers. Um, but, you know, and I don't even know why I chose that structure again. That was another choice that just fell that came out of nowhere. Cause I was like, Oh, well, what would she say? And then how would he look at it? And then I realized other authors have done it like for uh, Mick and Nora's infinite playlist, which is another YA music based book. Mm -hmm. I ended up reading afterwards. They use that format that he said, she said format. And I know Rainbow Rowell, she has, I think she did that for Fangirl. I think she goes back and forth. Um, so it had been done because I was doubting it first too. I said, wow, the structure is a little, this is kind of, this is, this is what I had in mind, but I liked it. And then I found out that it, that it, it is a method, but um, I'm glad it did work out at the end. And yeah, I do get mixed responses on that, but it feels, it felt natural to me. So I'm glad right. it worked out for you. <laughs> yeah, no, it did. Like I said, it was, it's one of those that whenever I see it, I, I, I always doubt it first. And then I'm like, but can they pull it off? And I think you pulled it off, Lisa. I like it. Thank you, Jeannie. <laughs> Thank you. How did you keep all of these conversations? Did you write them sequentially? Do you use a tool like Scrivener? Are you just playing Microsoft Word or any notepad? Or how do you, how do you what's your process? I, okay, so I'll write the story. I write from four, between 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. And then my son wakes up, I take him to school. And then from 8 a.m. to noon. And I just write with my, if it's like the first draft, I'll just write, write, write. And that's when the magic happens. And you're like laughing to yourself in, in front of your computer or crying. And then I go over the, what I, I wrote while I'm cooking and then dialogues just pops in my head. And then I just pull out my iPhone notes and I have dialogue and references, and then I'll plug it into the story if I see fit, or I just can it. You know, I have, I have 60,000 pages of uh, 60,000 words, sorry, 60,000 words of dialogue and scenes that I just never ended up using. Ooh, editing. Uh, Ed <laughs> yeah. It's about your editing process. Because again, it's, they say, kill your darlings. Is there anything that you was like, oh, it just doesn't fit, but I love this scene. Was it hard? Tell us about it. Um, okay. So for editing, what I do is I read it out loud to myself, which I really don't enjoy doing, but that's how you really can get the flavor and the flow of, uh, of the work. And yeah, there were some scenes. Yeah. I had, a, I had some scenes between um, Pete and his, uh, and his friend, Tony, that I found so entertaining, but it was like, we already, I mean, he, they already had so many fun scenes that I didn't need to have a third or a fourth one, but um, I have a scene. Yeah. Where uh, Tony visits Pete at Starbucks and you know, that I, that I ended up uh, canning in the end. And my husband was like, I love that scene, but I don't miss it because I've read it so many times without it that maybe I'll use it for something else. But, uh, but the, the relationship between Pete and Tony is actually one of my favorite relationships because they they couldn't be more opposite. This big Italian guy and, you know, with his firefighter shirts and then the like, you know, the skinny French prog rock dude. And it's just such a beautiful friendship. I was going to say, I love the the skinny French prog rock's dad because the idea of he always takes a good loaf of bread to any venue in case they don't have one. And that was the most French thing I'd ever read in my life. So that's beautiful. <laughs> but... <laughs> The Pete's dad is definitely inspired by my father-in-law, Pierre, who is incredible. My, okay, so the scene about the shutters, that came from my father-in-law because my father-in-law came to New York and he did not understand why there were shutters on the house if they don't close. And I was like, they're just show shutters. It just makes the house look pretty. And he was like, but you have to close the shutters at night. He's like, they won't even close, cover the window. Uh, did you have shutters in California? Because in New York, every house has these like little shutters on the side and the window is like five times the size. Oh, God, we it's even worse here. Yeah, because <laughs> they're just screwed to the wall and on. Oh, man, don't get yeah. me started. There's some of them that aren't even shutters. I mean, there's a lot of them that have no shutters whatsoever. We just give up. It's the, you know, the faux Adobe style. <laughs> OK, uh, yeah. Oh, God. It, oh, mm, mm, uh, California, that. if you ever come out, we're going to drive around together. And John is the best tour guide in the world because the architecture alone is what I love about California sometimes. And the oh, no, no. We'll, we'll get someone else. I want to come out to Paris and have you point out things to me, though. Totally. Because, yeah. Lisa, you, you've done other writing outside of this. You write out on 
uh, eating in Paris, touring around Paris. So you have a you've done a lot of other writing before you got around to writing your novel. Uh, yeah, I did a lot of travel writing when I first uh, when I first got here. Like I had a, a piece about um, how to kind of do Paris on the cheap that the Huffington Post ended up picking up. Um, and then I had a column on this uh, blog called Hip Paris about like being a, a, a mom, an American mom in France and how, you know, how about that experience. And uh, I definitely my I got my uh, my feet wet in publishing with um, writing about living in France. <laughs> Is what would you recommend if if there was a young person reading this that said or I shouldn't just say young, anybody that says, well, I think I could be a writer, but I'm not sure. What advice would you give them? I would say just, and it's so plain and simple, but just write because inspiration, you can't chase inspiration. You can't chase a good story. You just, your, your, your head, your heart and your fingers, it'll just flow, but just keep writing. You know, I was reading a uh, biography about Jack Kerouac and um, his good friend, Neil Cassidy, and who Neil Cassidy was like the muse for the beat generation between, you know, he was Allen Ginsberg's lover. And uh, I know him and Jack had this like intense love as well. And Neil always wanted to be a writer. And he always looked up to his like his more accomplished friends, William Burroughs and and Jack and, and Ginsburg, and he would ask them, well, what do I do? What do I do to write like you guys? And that's all they said. They're like, you just have to sit down and write. And he didn't want to do the work. And he did it for a month and just wrote and he, and he wasn't getting the results that he wanted. And Jack was like, you have to do it for like 10 years. <laughs> and when I read that, I said, yeah, you know? And so he tried to publish a book and an editor said, he tried to use big words and it said, it was like, he said it, it read like an ill-fitting suit, which I loved that like, <laughs> comparison because he totally got it. I'm like, you know, when you, when a writer is kind of stretching themselves out of, you can, out of their comfort zone because they're trying to sound intellectual or wordy. And I've done it myself. And that's why my memo was so bad because I was trying to write like a New Yorker writer, you know, and it just didn't come out genuine because that's not my style. We're, we're not and, all Fran Leibowitz, you know? <laughs> Yeah. And it just does, it comes out disingenuine. And I think you need to just keep plugging away. And if it takes 10 years, it takes 10 years. If it takes one year, it takes one year, you know, just to like get settled into your style. So just like write and play around with words, do the big words, make your, you know, I embarrassed myself a few times trying to sound wordy and, uh, you know, sound with all my 50 cent words. And it just didn't, it didn't come out right. It came out clunky. And for YA, they're still learning a lot of those words, you know? Yeah, I'm still, yeah, I'm still learning. And I'm, I'll probably maybe in 10 years look back on this book and say, oh, I, you know, I probably would have done this differently. Uh, oh, uh, you know, and I, I'll see how much I've learned when I turn 50, because I turn 40 next month. So, <laughs> well, happy birthday, young <laughs> <laughs> so what are you working on now? What's your next project? Uh, the sequel to this book. Excellent. How far are we along? Actually, all three books are, it's a, it's a trilogy. All three books are written. So I know the Sweet. end. And um, now I'm just in the process of editing book two and making it work a little better um, and where they end up. Um, and there is definitely some interesting characters because they're going to be in their 20, like 22, 23, early to mid 20s. So at that point, I'm going to have a little more fun with the dirty scenes and a little more fun with the, the cursing. Well, I, I'm just saying that for me personally, I need you to bring Ed back in the second book. So promise me that Ed returns. Special Ed, yes. <laughs> Special Ed, and you're right. Ed is just not a name that's easy to murmur romantically. And I loved that line. <laughs> uh, yeah, at 20 years old, she felt a little too young to be into a guy named Ed. It sounds like it's a very dad name. <laughs> <laughs> Dad. Well, we will put links to stories and the other interesting things we mentioned on our website, which is www.writersdrinkingcoffee.com. You can also find us on Facebook or Twitter. We answer email. Lisa, if somebody's got questions for you, can they reach out? Sure. I'm on Twitter. Uh, my handle is Lisa C. Michaud. And that's the same for Instagram. And I'm very reachable. I love hearing from readers. And so sh shoot me a message or a tweet and I'll, I'll get back to you. Fantastic. 
You've been listening to Writers Drinking Coffee, a labor of love and enthusiasm put together by the hosts. Our main web support magic is brought to you by Deirdre Schween, and our sound engineer and backup web spider is David Welsh. Our intro music is prog rock legend, sorry, not, Pretty Maid Milking a Cow, and our exit music is Breakfast with a Morning Person, both by Michael Langberg. You can hear more from Michael Langberg on manyhatsmusic.com. Our podcast sponsor is Jackal Designs, enabling you all to buy really cool WDC swag. And hey, thanks so much for listening. <laughs>